There are many diseases in our day which uh, are not recorded in history, and so we can call these modern society diseases. Of course, everybody knows there have been a number of infectious diseases that have arisen in the last uh, 25 years or so, but there are many other diseases as well that uh, have that are new on the scene. We want to discuss a few of these in this program, so we hope you'll join us for this discussion. The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Welcome to Help Yourself to Health with Dr. Agatha Thrash of Uchi Pines Institute. And now, here's your host, Dr. Thrash. The food for the body and the food for the mind are similarly quite effective in shaping who we are. Of course, the food for the body must be as good as we can possibly make it, and we should not discount the fact that food for the brain should be just as carefully chosen as is food for the body. So that means that the thoughts that we have, the reactions that we make toward other people, uh, just what we do with our lives when we are uh, alone, all of these things are things that uh, can influence the way that we think. There is a disease called schizophrenia. It uh, has many different forms. It can be catatonic, it can be simple, it can be hebephrenic. There are a number of different, ki different names that the psychiatrists put on this uh, topic of schizophrenia. Generally, the symptoms are that the person may be withdrawn. They don't quite have a sense of reality and just uh, where they are in where they are themselves positioned not only emotionally and mentally but also uh, to some degree in their physical world as well. So they are not fully in touch with reality. They may have habits of being alone. Uh, they may at times do destructive acts. They tend to have a flattened affect. That is they, they don't generally um, uh, have emotions that you would expect at the right time. If they do express an emotion, it is often either improper or out of place. So this describes to some degree what schizophrenia is. We don't have anything that exactly fits that in ancient history. Some people point to the King Saul in the Bible as being, being an example of schizophrenia, but I think that he was mainly depressed and um, angry, and this made his uh, strange reactions because he was still quite uh, functional in his position. And people with schizophrenia are often uh, non-functional. There is a, a so-called walking type of schizophrenia, but uh, that uh, just requires a little medication and the person can carry on quite well. But uh, for the most part, uh, people with schizophrenia are really quite sick with their disease. Now, uh, the negativism that they show often makes them um, not good companions, and people often don't enjoy being around them. They don't enjoy having them in their home. Sometimes a poor woman will decide, if I were just to marry this man who shows some mild signs of schizophrenia, I could just straighten him out very nicely. But she marries him, and he, the, the stresses of marriage precipitate a full-blown crisis, and he has to be hospitalized, sometimes for quite a long time. So um, we need to know that uh, marriage to a person with a mental illness is not the cure. It is often the thing that uh, causes the disease to become extremely difficult to handle. With schizophrenia, approximately three out of every hundred people in our Western population will have schizophrenia. So is there a way that we can handle this so that we can, uh, can treat it with success? And the answer is yes, we can treat some of these cases so that they are quite successful. We had a young man who uh, came to us from a large Catholic family in Florida. 
he was a fine young man, very strong and very uh, handsome young man, but he was definitely mentally ill. He was about 24 years old at the time that he came to Uchi Pines for treatment. And at that time, he had been in the hospital since he was 18. This young man was uh, given a treatment of uh, various uh, herbal things, uh, a, a completely plant-based diet, and hard labor. We also did some very good hydrotherapy for him. And uh, within about six or eight months, he was very well, not completely well, but he was so well that uh, he began to communicate with his family. They came to visit him several times. We felt that it was not safe yet for him to go home, that his uh, being better was still so fresh and new that perhaps he should stay in the program at our institute for a full year. So at the end of a year, uh, he did hard farm labor, many hours every day, and we think that was very good for him. The totally plant-based diet was good for him and the hydrotherapy. We gave him uh, a, a long, slow hydrotherapy, such as a neutral bath, we sometimes gave him a wet sheet pack, which is quite a comfortable treatment. Uh, he enjoyed that and uh, made improvements with this hydrotherapy. And at the end of a year, he was uh, sent home, not maybe as completely mentally balanced as someone else, but certainly well enough to function in society. He got a small job, he, got, he married, and I, I understand he now is uh, raising uh, another family in his Catholic tradition uh, in Florida. There was a time when mental institutions in the United States were using hydrotherapy quite extensively for schizophrenia and for depression. And uh, one psychiatrist who was with the Veterans Administration Hospital was accused of emptying the hospital uh, he got all of his patients well and sent them home. And uh, he enjoyed that kind of reputation because they often sent him some rather uh, serious cases of, um, of schizophrenia. Now, the kind of herbs that we use are just general herbs for the brain or for the mind. One of those is St. John's wort. Now, you may have heard that St. John's wort is no good for depression or for any kind of mental illness. A man by the name of Shelton did a large study and published that, um, I think it was in uh, 2003 or 2004, and he concluded at the end of his study that uh, there was no benefit in St. John's wort, no more benefit than in a placebo. When I saw that study published in a prominent medical journal, I thought there must be something wrong with this research because we have had some very good results at uh, Uchi Pines Institute with St. John's Wort. So I investigated a little bit. I found out that Pfizer, a prominent drug company in the United States, funded the research immediately. Some red flags went up and I, I thought Pfizer is the manufacturer of Zoloft, a very a uh, commonly used antidepressant agent uh, available in drugstores all over. So I thought that was, that was one big red flag. I thought here is something to be uh, suspicious about. <clears throat> then the second thing that I was suspicious about was that there were five very large studies done on St. John's wort shown to be effective. Uh, using very carefully structured research projects. And they, those researchers discovered that St. John's work was really quite effective. So I wondered if these two things might be sufficient to make it so that I would, uh, should just discount this study altogether. But as I read some reviews done by some researchers in the field of agriculture and uh, botanicals, at um, the uh, Department of Agriculture in Washington, I found out that there were some other things as well. One was that they virtually told the patients that they were giving them 
something that was ineffectual because they instituted very strong anti-suicidal uh, programs to let the patients know that if they felt suicidal, just let them know and uh, they would help them with something that would, would affect their uh, mental uh, brightness. Well, that would essentially tell me if I were on that program that the test agent is something that's not effective. Either it's the placebo or it's an agent they don't expect to be uh, very effective. And uh, then the fact that the uh, researchers did not compare St. John's work with Zoloft was also very interesting. Why did they not set up the, the uh, double-blind study with three agents, the placebo, the herb, and uh, their own Zoloft? That was the thing that had been recommended by all of the researchers who had done uh, research on St. John's work prior to that. So as with many studies that have been done using herbal remedies or herbal substances, I have flawed the study because it was not properly structured. And uh, this one I think we can also flaw. And uh, you may feel quite free to use St. John's work in any kind of emotional or mental disorder and expect that you will get some benefit. Now in addition to St. John's work, I usually use something like ginkgo which increases the blood flow to the central nervous system and can be very effective that way. Uh, furthermore, if the person has some dominant symptom like they are excited or anxious or irritated or nervous, I will usually give something like catnip or skull cap or valerian root that tends to be calming to these individuals. So uh, with, uh, armed with this kind of uh, information, I hope that you can feel that you can be of benefit to those who uh, have some kind of mental or emotional difficulty who are uh, among your friends or family. Now, we, are, we have a number of other problems in our modern health scene. One of those is uh, bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Those are very big words. And uh, Dr. Miller, what do those big words mean? <laughs> They're very simple. As a matter of fact, if you live where we live, down there on the Chattahoochee River, you'll find that this is a, a major topic. They don't use these words. But the problem we have living near the Chattahoochee River, although we don't have it, those in Columbus do, is upriver it goes to the city of Atlanta. Now Atlanta likes to dump some of their sewage into the Chattahoochee River. See the old mindset used to be that dilution was the solution to pollution. You put, a, you put a, a, a certain amount of a pollutant in a large amount of water or air or land and it will dilute out no problem. Trouble is we're finding toxic levels of raw sewage in the water now 100 miles south in the city of Columbus, Georgia. That's what we might call bioaccumulation. Basically, at the first trophic level, we start having pollutants accumulating wherever that might be. Now, as we have that problem, we have the people down there on the banks of the river fishing for fish who are living in this polluted water. Well, sometimes you've got in that water, or always in that water, you've got little plankton that are living off of the, uh, the water and the sunshine, and they will be absorbing into the little organisms a certain amount of the toxins coming down from upstream you'll have some herbivorous fish which will eat this plankton and it will further accumulate or magnify, this is where we have biomagnification in its little body. Then we have a big old bass, a carnivorous fish coming by, eating that little herbivorous fish. It will magnify more in its body and then the fisherman catches this bass, very proud of himself, goes home, fillets it, fries it and eats it, not knowing that he's getting a huge amount of the toxins that came from upstream. Now, there are uh, various things that we have in our society that are giving us great problems with this problem of biomagnification and bioaccumulation. We see this in our food chain. Uh, I read a book some years ago by a veterinarian, and it, basically the way they were uh, feeding the chickens is the, the conveyor belt goes in front of the chickens with their food, and another conveyor belt behind that picks up their, their waste. 
and it gets to the one end, they mix the waste with more food and more growth hormones, it goes right back through again, and so the animal eats over and over again this more and more concentrated levels of its nutrients or these, these growth hormones, which are going to cause a huge problem in their particular bodies, and so we need to stay away from this. A really good example of um, in the 1950s of this problem, before we really recognize it as a problem, you see back during World War II, uh, in the South Pacific during World War II, there was a big problem with malaria. Well, the scientists got together and came up with a very good insecticide to kill the mosquitoes. That insecticide is called DDT. In the 1950s, they were having a malaria breakout in the country of Borneo. And so the World Health Organization had airplanes fly over and spray the whole area with DDT. It worked like a charm. See, the people were dying of malaria. Now they killed the mosquitoes and malaria fell. That's the good news. The bad news is, besides the malaria falling, their roofs started falling. You see, the DDT was killing the little parasitic wasps that flew around there. And the parasitic wasps would kill the thatch-eating caterpillars. Well, now the thatch-eating caterpillars were thriving, and so they were eating the thatch and causing the roofs to fall in. But the other insects that were being killed were falling to the ground and being eaten by the geckos, uh, starting to magnify in the bodies. And the cats would eat the geckos because they're easy prey now, accumulated in their body to the point where they would die of the DDT overdose. And then the rats started to thrive, and they started being threatened with typhus and the plague. And so what the World Health Organization had to do is fly over airplane and parachute cats down to this area uh, of um, Borneo because bioaccumulation and biomagnification is so upset the ecosystem that they had to somehow try to get back in there and restore it into the proper levels. And so we see this a lot in our societies today as we're, uh, we see our oceans. I remember a number of years ago when Ch uh, Jacques Cousteau died, within a month they had written his memoirs or published his memoirs, and he said within 20 years the oceans will be dead. Now they're not dead yet, but they are dying. You go to the deepest rifts of the, of the oceans and pull up any living organisms, you'll find significant amounts of different toxins, and one of them which will be DDT. As we uh, consume these products, as we consume products, especially animal products which seem to uh, store the toxins or accumulate those toxins and magnify the toxins in their bodies, if we eat those uh, animals, we ourselves are getting a massive dose. It's better to buy the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and seed, wash them off, and eat them. You may be getting a small amount of uh, pollutants, but nowhere near the amount that you're going to get from eating uh, animal products that accumulate them and magnify them. And so I think, Dr. Thrash, we need to sort of stay away from these things. Dr. Miller, I understood that in this country, DDT had been uh, outlawed. Is it, it, it has been outlawed in this because it was replaced by DDD. And, uh, but what we did when we no longer were producing DDT for ourselves, we started selling it overseas. And we get much of our uh, exotic produce from overseas, and so we're going to get the residues from there. Plus a fish that grows over here swims a thousand miles over here, or they get, catch the fish over there. We're going to get it one way or the other. Mm. Yes, I can see how that would certainly be true. Another problem that we have in modern times is AIDS. AIDS, or autoimmune deficiency disorder, is a, a very serious problem. In some countries of Africa, um, there are very few adults alive in cities. The major people who are there are just children uh, under 20 years of age. So it can be a most serious problem. Is there something that we can do that can help with the disease after it has already developed, or uh, when it develops in children who uh, have a lifestyle that is uh, not conducive to the disease, but nevertheless they get it from their parents. Yes, there are a number of things that we can do. Uh, we had a man who had full-blown AIDS, was in the hospital with pneumocystis pneumonia in France. We never did see the patient, but uh, he called, uh, his family called uh, urgently requesting that we take him at our institute. They realized that there were no um, drugs in standard medicine at that time that were effective, and they wanted to try some uh, simple remedies and uh, felt that we were the best place possible 
for him to get, that they knew of, for him to get this kind of treatment. The family were quite well to do and they were willing to fly him in an ambulance plane all the way to uh, Uchi Pines so that we could treat him. We explained to, him, to them that uh, we don't take AIDS patients because of uh, the way that we're set up with students and the like and the fact that our situation is not such that we can uh, have an infectious patient in with our other patients. So we uh, said we can't take him here, but we will do what we can to try to help you to treat him there. So we told them all the things that we would do, the herbs that we would use, the uh, various hydrotherapy measures that we would use, the kind of diet for the man, and um, the outcome of it was that in a few months his lymph nodes had gone down and uh, he was uh, feeling much better. Eventually, after uh, almost a year, he went back to work again and he lived on for several more years. Then the time came when he decided that he did not like staying on the routine that we had given him. He did not like being in the lifestyle that we felt would be the most conducive to good health. And so he went back into his old lifestyle with uh, drinking and uh, carousing and uh, the things that he had been prone to do beforehand. And within about six months, he was dead. Now, was he going to die anyway? We don't know that, but we do know that uh, he did have a good response. We had another man in California, almost the same scene, uh, including the fact that he went back into the old lifestyle and was dead in just a few months after he returned to it. So these two patients that we have had, that we have not taken to Uchi Pines, but have treated them through the families, this has nerved us to feel that the simple remedies can be quite effective in at least forestalling the uh, immediate outcome of a full-blown case of AIDS and making that disease regress to the HIV positive state uh, but without the full-blown AIDS. Now some refinements of what we did we gave fever treatments in which we brought the fever of the person up to 104. Uh, at first, they were not able to take that high level of uh, raising the body temperature, but as, the, as time progressed, they were able to take the uh, heat treatments so that the mouth temperature went up to 104. This is done every day for five days, then a rest of two days, they repeat this three times for three weeks and then take a rest of a week. Then the series is repeated, another rest of a week. The series is repeated a third time and this time a rest for a month. This kind of treatment with the fever is uh, carried on for, the, for a full year. A plant-based diet is uh, the most effective to boost the effectiveness of the immune system and a number of herbs are also very good. Garlic is very good. It is also antimicrobial, and for any benefit that it might be for the retrovirus, uh, we use that as well. Uh, we use ashwagandha, um, the golden seal, the echinacea. All of these are known to boost the effectiveness of the immune system and uh, to help the person get in full control of uh, their disease if that is possible. So we know that there is benefit for the person with AIDS. Whether we can ever see a person cured is a matter for research. And now uh, another uh, problem that we're having in our age is that of zoonoses. We have several that uh, are known today to be uh, associated with the animal kingdom, and, and uh, Dr. Miller is going to talk with you about that now. Of course, it's, it's interesting that it's, uh, zoonoses are peculiar to the animal kingdom. Basically, a zoonotic disease is a disease that's transmissible from an animal to the human. Let me just read off a little list. As, uh, as Dr. Thrash has been talking, I just decided to uh, write down a small list and think about what all these have in common. SARS, AIDS, West Nile virus, Ebola, E. coli, monkeypox, flu, uh, worms, limes, Crutchfield Jacobs, and we could go on and on. As a matter of fact, I was on the internet the other day and I was looking up uh, diseases acquired from animals. 
I've got a long list from horses, a long list from cows, a long list from sheep and goats, a long list, of course, from rodents, a long list from rabbits, hares, and pikas, cats, dogs, man's best friend. We see a large amount of new diseases coming from this basically melting pot of, of a disease sump that we have. As a matter of fact, I read an article not long ago saying that probably at least 75% of all new diseases are coming from the animal kingdom. Where do our flus come from? Our flus come from that little melting pot of diseases over there in, in China, in the Hong Kong area, where you've got ducks and chicken and pigs and humans and drugs all living in close proximity, and they're growing these super strains of bugs, and that's why we get all these different strains of bugs, the Hong Kong flu, the swine flu, the avian flu, all these different things are coming into our systems. I was in Siberia a couple of years ago just after uh, this big SARS thing came out, and one of the doctors in the seminar that we were teaching there, she says, you know, it's interesting. I just came from a symposium before I came here to, to this seminar, way over there in eastern Russia, and they were talking about SARS, and there's something interesting they found out about SARS. Vegetarians either do not get it or get very mild cases of the SARS. And I thought, well, that's a pretty nice reason to become a vegetarian because SARS was a really scary thing over there. We find that lifestyle in the AIDS and many of these diseases, we just take care of ourselves. But we're living in a time when I believe the whole animal kingdom is diseased and we need to be as much as possible putting some type of a barrier between animals and ourselves, uh, especially don't eat the things. And uh, if you have an animal in your environment, make sure that animal is healthy. Uh, you're finding today that animals have the same diseases as humans. Diabetes, cancer, coronary heart disease, they all have the same thing because they're eating like we're eating and we're starting to get diseases passing between the, the species. And this isn't a dangerous thing, Dr. Thrash, and so I think these zoonotic diseases need to be uh, studied a little bit more carefully. Yes, and interestingly also, some of the same things that we have found in humans will help them, will also help animals. So veterinarians, I have a friend who is a veterinarian who comes to me often and has some little pet that she is uh, really working at diligently and uh, asks me what uh, I would, how I would treat a human if uh, uh, they had that same disorder. So while we can't uh, claim to cure a lot of diseases that are modern society diseases, we can try to understand them and protect ourselves from them.